The scripture reading this morning is from the book of John, chapter 12, verses 20 through 33. There were some Greeks in town who had come up to worship at the feast. They approached Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. Sir, we want to see Jesus. Can you help us? Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip together told Jesus. Jesus answered, Time's up. The time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Listen carefully. Unless a grain of wheat is buried in the ground, dead to the world, it is never any more than a grain of wheat. But if it is buried, it sprouts and reproduces itself many times over. In the same way, anyone who holds on to life just as it is, destroys that life. But if you let go, reckless in your love, you will have it forever, real and eternal. If any of you wants to serve me, then follow me. Then you will be where I am, ready to serve at a moment's notice. The Father will honor and reward anyone who serves me. Right now I am shaken. And what am I going to say? Father, get me out of this? No. This is why I came in the first place. I'll say, Father, put your glory on display. A voice came out of the sky. I have glorified it, and I'll glorify it again. <clears throat> the listening crowd said, Thunder! Others said, An angel spoke to him. Jesus said, The voice didn't come for me, but for you. At this moment, the world is in crisis. Now Satan, the ruler of this world, will be thrown out. And I, as I am lifted up from the earth, will attract everyone to me and gather them around me. He put this, he put it this way to show how he was going to be put to death. And now we'll have the sermon hymn, I Surrender All. Please remain seated. Jesus, 
we will gain eternal life. Now you may be thinking, didn't we just hear Pastor Kathy preach a similar message? Yes, you did. On Ash Wednesday, her message was, what do we need to let go of? What earthly things are we holding on to that come between us and God that can threaten to rob us of our eternal life? And then just two weeks after that, the assigned scripture for that Sunday was on a similar theme from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, which says, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to be in the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Now, today's assigned scripture repeats the theme again. Three times in six weeks, we are pointed to the same message from Psalms and the two gospels. So why repeat the same message over again so soon? I can think of two reasons. First, comparing the Mark 8 and John 12 passages, Jesus was speaking to a different audience each time. And second, Jesus was running out of time. In Mark, Jesus was with the disciples alone. For three years, he had been teaching and preparing them for this time when he was to be crucified and the work of carrying on his message and establishing his church was going to be left into their hands. The disciples knew that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God, but they still didn't understand the scope of what that meant. They were still living with their own human desires and feelings. They were ready to receive the glory of the Messiah, but not the persecution that came with it. They still didn't see the whole picture, and Jesus knew that. In today's passage from John, as I said, Jesus has a different audience. His disciples were with him. However, there was also a crowd of people who were following him into Jerusalem because they had heard about his miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead. In this crowd were some Greeks who had come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. Why mention the Greeks specifically in this passage? There were some Greeks who, even though they still worshipped their own gods, had begun to follow some of the Jewish teachings. They had heard about a coming Messiah, and they were curious about this miracle worker, Jesus of Nazareth, and they wanted to see him for themselves. Although Jesus came to preach first to the Jews, in John's Gospel it is clear that Jesus' message of salvation is for all who believe in him. When he said, whoever serves me must follow me, he was talking to these Greeks and all the other non-Jews as well. He welcomed everyone who came with an open heart, unlike the Jews, who considered anyone of a different faith to be an outsider and unfit to be one of God's chosen people. Well, if we take this to a little bit deeper level, these Greeks represented a whole world of people who are in desperate need of Jesus. Philip and Andrew only see two Greeks who want to see Jesus. But Jesus sees a world crying out in need. He knows that his message needs to spread to the whole world. But because Jesus was human, he was limited. His human body could only be in one place at a time. His ministry on earth was limited to only 30 years. Jesus knows that this is why he must be crucified. So when he is resurrected, he can move beyond the limitations of the flesh or the confines of time. In verse 27, we hear Jesus say, Now my heart is troubled. He dreads what is to come. He wants to be delivered from this horrible death. 
But more than that, he wants his Father to be glorified. And he wants his followers to understand what's going to happen. Not only that he must die, but especially that he will live again. The only way that Jesus can go global is to remove his human limitations by dying on the cross and then being resurrected with his divine power fully restored. Only then will he be able to be everywhere with everyone as equal with God and to rule his kingdom. So Jesus announces to everyone, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. He's trying to make his disciples understand that his crucifixion is imminent. <coughs> so far, even though he has told them this so many times, they still haven't understood why he had to go to the cross. They were in denial. So he tries again by telling a parable of a kernel of wheat that has to die before it can come back and produce many seeds. Jesus uses the analogy of the kernel of wheat because he hopes that this might be something they will understand. In this parable, Jesus with his human limitations, is the grain of wheat. So put that picture in your mind and listen. A kernel of wheat could be ground into a very tiny amount of flour. It would then be consumed, but then it's gone, used up. It cannot feed anyone anymore. But if the seed is buried in the ground and dies, it produces many seeds, more flour, more food, the bread that sustains life. I read a story about a first grade teacher who gave each of her young students a navy bean. They were supposed to take the bean home, place it between two damp paper towels to keep it moist, and then watch it to see what was going to happen. As the days passed, the beans became mushy, and some of them got moldy. The teacher asked, do you think the beans are dead? And the teacher looked at the children who were nodding in miserable agreement, yes. So suppressing a smile, she counseled, let's wait a few more days. More days of anxious waiting passed, and finally on a Monday morning, one of the children burst through the door, clutching for dear life her paper towel containing a soggy bean with a tiny green shoot coming out of the top. The teacher was beaming and she told her class that the seed had gone through a dying in order to get to new life. Even when the children were much older, when they lived far away from that little town, when they were adults, they would remember what their teacher had taught them. Sometimes there has to be a dying before something can live. So Jesus ends his parable of the wheat by saying, anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. I think this is one of many parables that Jesus taught his disciples that was very hard for them to understand. And for us too. I struggled with this for many years. They often asked Jesus to speak plainly so they would understand what he meant. <clears throat> Hate their life. Hate is such a strong word. But in this text, it doesn't mean that they hate their lives or hate themselves. Rather, it means that we are willing to give up all that we have, including our lives, if doing so will glorify Christ. To set aside our selfishness, comfort, and pleasure so we can serve God lovingly and willingly. We can't put ourselves first and fulfill God's purpose at the same time. Those two things just do not go together. If we choose to follow our own path, we may do good things along the way, but we will never fulfill our potential. Jesus says we must choose to lose our lives so we can live out the purpose that he has planned for us. So let's take stock 
from where we are. Jesus tells the crowd that everyone, even the non-Jews, are welcome in the kingdom of God. Then he uses the parable of the grain of wheat to explain that he, as the Son of Man, must die and will rise again in full glory. And if that isn't enough, now Jesus starts speaking as plainly as possible. Right now I am shaken. And what am I going to say? Father, get me out of this? No, this is why I came in the first place. I can just picture Jesus looking at a sea of blank faces on his disciples, staring back at him. No wonder his heart is troubled. At that point, God sends a voice from heaven. Some think it's thunder. Others think an angel spoke to Jesus. But the voice wasn't for Jesus. It was for the people. And Jesus told them, The world is in crisis, and I have to be crucified in order to return as the resurrected Messiah, to throw Satan out of the world. And I, as I am lifted up from the earth, will attract everyone to me, and gather them around me. He put it this way to show how he was going to be put to death. In other words, he's saying, wake up. Open your eyes and see beyond yourself. See something more important. God is telling you that I will be lifted up and hung on a cross to die. Then I am coming back so that you can live. He could not say it more plainly than that. Jesus chose to be obedient to God in order to fulfill his purpose. But what if he hadn't? What if he chose not to go through with the crucifixion and just stayed in Nazareth? He had a good job as a carpenter, a steady income, a loving family. He was part of a community and lived in a quiet respectable place and a quiet, respectable lifestyle. That life offered him a sense of accomplishment, enough material success, a settled way of life worth hanging on to. Jesus could have kept all of this, but instead he left his comfortable life, his family, and everything familiar. He just left, trusting that God would take care of him. And what did God do? He allowed Jesus to suffer hunger and thirst, the elements in the desert, loneliness, and ultimately attacks by Satan himself. God allowed these things to prepare Jesus for what was to come. He needed to understand the sufferings of God's people, to know their pain and their temptations. It was all part of the plan part of the purpose for which Jesus came to save mankind. Jesus knew the end of the story when he decided to leave Nazareth, and he left anyway. When our lives become difficult and we are tempted to give up on walking the hard road, remember Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. While he was sweating drops of blood, he prayed, Father, if this is at all possible, take this cup from me. Was there any other way besides going to the cross? He had come so far. He was so close to completing his mission. He could still change his mind and not have to suffer the agony of the cross. But then what would happen? He would have lived his life as a great rabbi, and then he would die like all the rest of us, and that would be the end. He would have led us to the gates of heaven, but not given us the keys to get in. He would be remembered by history as a great prophet and teacher, but that's all. We would all, every one of us, be doomed, and Satan would have the victory. We would all be paying the price for our sins. But Jesus didn't choose himself. He chose God. He was willing to give up his divine rights in order to obey God and save mankind. He chose to lose his life for us. 
And that led not only to his resurrection, but to ours as well. That's why we can look to Jesus when we're going through trials and suffering. That's why we can look to Jesus when we're lost and we don't know which way to turn. God is always caring for us and planning our next steps. He gave each of us a purpose. When we are willing to walk in His will for us, we will walk with His blessing, and He will be using us to be a blessing to others. He will turn our trials into our testimonies so we can witness to and encourage others. Losing our lives to God means choosing His will above our own. Losing our lives to God means serving the Lord in whatever ways we are called. And losing our lives to God means trusting in Him in good times and bad, letting Him lead in all areas of our lives, and following Him even if we don't know where He's taking us. Where I am, there my servants will be. Praise be to God. Amen.